Bonjour. Good morning, everyone. Je m'appelle Charmaine Dean, et je suis la vice-présidente de recherche à l'Université de Waterloo. C'est un plaisir pour moi d'être avec vous ici aujourd'hui. My name is Charmaine Dean, and I'm the vice president of research at the University of Waterloo. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. Today, the Honorable Bill Blair, President of the Queen's Privy Council Office and Minister of Emergency Preparedness, will make a funding announcement under the Search and Rescue New Initiatives Fund to the University of Waterloo. Aujourd'hui, l'Honorable Bill Blair, President du Conseil Privé de la Reine, a Minister de Protection Civile, fera une annonce de financement dans la carte du fond de nouvelles initiatives de recherche et de sauvetage à l'Université de Waterloo. He will be joined by the Honorable Bardish Chaga, Member of Parliament for Waterloo, Ontario. Il sera accompagné par l'honorable Bardish Chaga, député de Waterloo, Ontario. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. We have a lot of active work toward reconciliation that takes place across all our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized in our Office of Indigenous Relations. I'm pleased to introduce Elder Henry to give us an Indigenous opening. Oh, bujo, Sego, Segoli. You know, this day has uh, been, I guess if we look at it, the uh, Creator brought the rain and, and the rain is what we come to know as a cleansing medicine, the medicine that helps everything grow. If you look outside from here, uh, just not too long ago, we planted a, a cedar tree, which talks about our, I guess, partnership that we're developing here at the University of Waterloo. And it's been such a wonderful process to start this, you know, beautiful friendship. What we're going to do over the next few years is, I think, going to be historical. The, the amount of movement that this university would like to see introducing indigenous culture throughout its uh, whole being will, will definitely be something to be proud of. So I'm really proud to, to say that uh, I'm, I'm a part of this, this beautiful university and the Faculty of Health that uh, has demonstrated time and time again that this is important, this is a part of the, the strategy that's going to exist for a long time. So today, with that beautiful rain and, and now the sun's coming through, we're actually feeling what Creator wanted us to feel is that energy of life and growth. I, I know um, last night when I was sleeping, uh, I felt uh, our grandmother Moon uh, travel over us. And as she did, she carried some wisdom that I think is necessary for all of us to, to understand. That you know, this world carries an abundance of, of strength and energy. And then at a, particular time this morning, there was a transition of, of responsibility when Grandmother Moon passed that responsibility over to Father Son. At that moment, the energy of light began. And when we carry that energy through our bodies, we know that the reflection of what our being is to be on this earth is to carry our, our responsibilities as, as brothers and sisters. So today I'd like to start this day off in, in this uh, moment with uh, some of the words that was taken away from my grandparents and my parents. They were told that uh, we couldn't use our language because it was useless and, and there was no reason to continue on with the language that was perpetuated on, on our people of all nations here in, in Turtle Island. So I'm going to open up uh, in slightly in defiance of, of that method uh, because it's definitely something that we need to steer our minds from. Uh, we had a conversation earlier this morning about uh, the flags that we have here. And uh, one of the flags that was always associated with uh, protests and 
uh, gatherings that sometimes weren't positive, um, a lot of people in their minds have gotten this flag uh, uh, associated with those things. But it's actually a, a, a unity flag. It, it comes from the spirit of the men and, and the heartfelt warmth that the men have to provide uh, while we walk on this earth. So I thought it was really important that we mention that because we have to change our thinking. You know, what, what we perceive in, in indigenous, what people think is, is acts of defiance. It's actually trying to bring unity in protecting our mother, the earth. So I think that's really important for us to understand. You know, everybody here, we're in an educational institute and it's a good time to learn. So I'd like to uh, start off this way by saying, uh, uh, Bujo. My ingan in Dejnikaz, Deshkan Zibi and Donjiba, my ingan do dem, Chimigwech, Kajamna do, Manda Ganaj, Wangish got nongum, Chimigwech, Kajamna do, Chimigwech, Wabanung, Jawanung, Epping the Schmuck, Kiwaid Nung, Getchimanado, Chimigwech, Minwa, Kinawasiak, Mam P, Ganaju and Mazak Mikwe, Getchimanado, Chimigwech, Minwa, Kinawasiak, Mam P, Mashkiki, Osama, Wingush, Mashko de Wish, Minwagijik, Getchimanado, Chimigwech, Minwa, Kinawasiak, Mam P, Nijan Sananik. So in, in those words that I offered, um, I, I, I heard uh, my creator at one point tell me that we need to acknowledge this beautiful land, our ancestors, the beautiful medicines that grow on this place we call Mother Earth, and the opportunity for us to share this land the way that creator wanted us to all along. Uh, I'm about to go into a session where I'm going to talk about creation and, and Bamada Ziwin, which is about life. And I think this is a good day and a good opportunity to remind ourselves that we can be cordial. We can walk this earth in unity and we can walk this earth in friendship. We just need to get back to our understanding that this place was built in, with love on our, on our beautiful mother, the earth. So if we feel the energy uh, of what she's trying to bring to our attention, then I think we can find our way to walk this earth in, in a great way as possible. So I just wanted to say that and uh, hope your, your day goes well. The things that you do today and the things that you remember tonight, you'll share with your communities, your children, your partners, that you know this place needs to be a part of our heart. Our, our creation will, will give us the energy to do that if we want to feel that. So let's take this opportunity once again to, to be a part of each other's world and to make it better because our future generations deserve us to do the right thing. And I think if we do that, I have, there's some hope. You know, climate change is here, there's other issues that we have to face, but if we as one heartbeat, one strength, we can build a nation that's gonna be proud for all of us in our future generations. So Chi Miigwech for allowing me to, to come and share some words with you this morning. Uh, I don't know where those words came from, they just came from my heart at this moment and, and uh, Creator helps uh, sometimes during these times. So, Chi Miigwech for your, your attendance today. Oh, Miigwech. Thank you so much, Elder Henry. And welcome again, Minister Blair. We're so pleased to have you here. And Bardish, really pleased to have you here. And all our MPs, thank you so much for being here. And also, our very special guests. So, to give you an overview of the event, we're going to first hear from Minister Blair. MP Chaga, Dr. Lily Liu, she's the Dean of the Faculty of Health at the University of Waterloo, and then myself, which will, we will follow that with a period of questions and answers. Happy to take your questions at that point. Pour vous donner un aperçu de déroulement de l'événement d'aujourd'hui, nous entendrons d'abord de brève allocution du Minister Blair de la députée Chagas, de Lily Liu, Doyen de la Faculté de Santé à l'Université de Waterloo, et de moi-même. Suive d'une période de questions et de réponses. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Bardish Chaga, Member of Parliament for Waterloo, to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Vice President Dean, for that kind introduction and your words today. Uh, Elder Maigan, your heart is beautiful. And for you to take the time to share your language um, into my ears, uh, which will 
get into my soul and my heart means a lot to me. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for always starting us off the right way. And, you know, I love when Father's Son shows up. And we sure needed some sunshine today. Um, Mr. Blair, it's always great to have you in the Waterloo region, especially here at the University of Waterloo in the riding of Waterloo. And I am so pleased to be joined by my colleagues, Valerie Bradford, Member of Parliament for Kitchener South Hespler, Brian May, Member of Parliament for Cambridge, as well as Tim Lewis, Member of Parliament for Kitchener Conestoga. Just a few minutes ago, Minister Blair and my colleagues, Tim Lewis, Brian May, and Valerie Bradford, finished a roundtable where we spoke with team members from the University of Waterloo about the work they are doing to find new, innovative ways to keep our communities healthy, vibrant, and safe. And I really do want to say thank you to everyone who made themselves available for that roundtable. Um, Dean Liu, you did a fabulous job. It felt like such a natural conversation. And something Minister Blair often says is that he does not want people to be rushed because he knows the importance of learning and you all have so much to offer. And the way you hosted us within that room and created that space, I think allowed us to learn so much today. And I think that also speaks to the elders' words and the importance of education and learning and doing better and being better. And that is something that we really do pride ourselves about and on doing here at the University of Waterloo and within the riding of Waterloo. The project that we are supporting today which Minister Blair will have more to say about shortly, will be pivotal in assisting those in our community living with dementia. And I very much look forward to seeing the outcomes of this work in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Before I turn the mic over to Minister Blair, I do once again want to thank uh, specifically uh, Dr. Lily Liu, Dean of Faculty of Health for her and her team's dedication to our community. All of us are extremely grateful for the work that you do. And I will now be passing the floor over to a, a dear friend and a colleague. And I really do want to commend you, Minister Blair, for the announcement today. I think it is so amazing. And you've totally broadened my horizons and my mind, and I'm sure I speak for my colleagues, in the way that you're approaching emergency preparedness and bringing that human element into it, because it is about saving lives, something that you have done basically your whole life. So we're really pleased to see you continue this work. So I will now pass on the floor to the President of the Queen's Privy Council and Minister of Emergency Preparedness, the Honourable Bill Blair. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bart Bartish, for the kind remarks and the incredibly warm welcome that I always receive when I come to Waterloo. I have to tell you, of, of all the people I know in Waterloo, no, none is more prouder of her community <laughs> than Bartish, and she reminds me constantly that although I'm from Toronto, I'm from one of the eastern suburbs of Waterloo. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to begin, if I may, by acknowledging that this announcement, of course, is taking place on the traditional territory of the Neutral, the Anishinaabeg, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Elder Henry for, for helping us open this discussion in a, in a very good way, and, and it's always very important. Um, as I've already indicated, as Bart just mentioned, I'm very pleased to be joined here by my friend and colleague, Bartis Chager, but also by our other parliamentary colleagues, Tim Lewis, Valerie Bradford, and Brian May. Um, I also want to join Bartish in taking a moment to recognize uh, Dr. Lily Liu, Dean of Faculty of Health here at the University of Waterloo. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude on behalf of the Government of Canada for all that you and your team have done to make today's important announcement possible and for the remarkable a round table that you just hosted for us. It was an opportunity to listen and to learn and to be inspired by the dedication and commitment of so many people and to, and to be reminded of the importance of this work. And as Bardish has said, this is about keeping Canadians safe. This is about saving lives. I don't think there's any higher calling for any of us than to, in, in service to our fellow citizens. And it was reaffirming and inspiring to be joined by so many people who share that commitment. Witnessing someone you love struggle with the challenges of dementia can be heartbreaking. And when they go missing, it can be very, very dangerous. Research has shown that if a person with Alzheimer's disease is not found, within 12 hours of being lost, there is a 50% chance that they could be found injured or even dead from hypothermia, dehydration, or drowning. And this means every search for a person suffering from Alzheimer's is an emergency. And sadly, it's a danger all too familiar to the search and rescue community and to Canadian families right across this country from coast to coast. We know that our population is aging. And along with that, we know that the number of people who go missing due to dementia 
is also increasing. 60% of people living with dementia will wander away at least once. Some of them may do so repeatedly. And the rates of dementia within our Indigenous populations are even disproportionately higher than the general population of Canada. And because of the nature of those remote and, and often isolated communities, the risk of those individuals going missing can be significantly higher as well. That includes those living with dementia in rural and remote communities, as I've said, and they may have different levels of access to service, linguistic and cultural challenges as well, as well as the limitations of capacity within their communities. And as our population ages, we need to identify the shortcomings in how we care for and protect our seniors, including adapting and strengthening how we respond to emergencies involving missing persons. And it gets me to, to this, this morning's important announcement. Today, I am very honored to announce that the federal government is providing funding of $2.1 million to support a three-year project undertaken by the University of Waterloo to enhance Canada's search and rescue systems to better respond when people living with dementia go missing. The project, which is called Managing Risks of Going Missing Among Persons Living with Dementia by Building Capacities of Search and Rescue Personnel, First Responders and Communities, will help to build capacity and it will also create greater understanding within the search and rescue community, improving their response when working with this vulnerable population. It will enable us to develop protocols for first responders in two Indigenous communities as part of the work in seven provinces. And we were joined this morning from representatives from Gananagui, and, and their participation in this program is going to be essential to ensure that we address the unique challenges within Indigenous communities, but also incorporate traditional Indigenous knowledge into our learning. It will help to build research partnerships and increase systemic coordination. And it will involve a made in Canada approach to data collection with methods to monitor the issue where climate funding and culture may differ from other jurisdictions, other jurisdictions where we currently gather much of our data. And ultimately all of this will strengthen our ability of our dedicated search and rescue experts and volunteers to safely, safely seamlessly and professionally respond. The government of Canada is proud to support initiatives like this one and it will result in effective and better coordinated search and rescue capacity and ultimately, as I've said, these programs will keep Canadians safe and help save Canadian lives. On behalf of the Prime Minister and the Government of Canada, I'd like to take the opportunity to express my very sincere thanks to all here involved at the University of Waterloo for their project and their commitment to making a difference. I wish all of you the best with this important new project and I look forward to the findings of your research and, and the eventual work that it will inform I'm excited about the improvements that will stem from this important work. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Chez Miigwech. Thank you for your remarks, Minister Blair. And m importantly, thank you for making this a priority. And thank you for having the foresight to be able to advance this particular area and to promote and encourage innovation in this area. Um, search and rescue activities, especially in ways that engage with communities. We're really proud at the University of Waterloo to host this research project. Waterloo has a very strong tradition of fostering innovation in our research, in how we train our students, our relationships with our communities. Our researchers are really working hard to work jointly with communities in order to develop solutions. Today's announcement speaks to Waterloo's drive to solve really complex problems. Minister Blair talked about the challenges. If you consider the challenges of protecting some of our vulnerable populations, those with dementia in, a, in an urban setting, um, all the complicated nature of the work surrounding it. In a community like, the, like Waterloo, and then now think about um, how much more complicated that is in working in a northern environment where there's lack of access to health systems. Uh, Minister Blair talked about several other challenges. Um, it's so difficult already, and we are working hard on that at our institution because we have a strong focus on aging and age-related diseases but so much more difficult in rural communities and bringing our technologies and our technological bent alongside our healthcare um, delivery focus in order to solve these problems is gonna be so innovative, we believe. We are ready to take this challenge. 
working on projects like these where we engage so meaningfully with our stakeholders, with our northern communities, um, with Waterloo's rich talent um, can help to develop the solutions. I would also like to join everyone else in thanking Dr. Lily Liu. She is an outstanding member of our community and she has been instrumental. She and the team here have been instrumental in thinking about how to advance work on these problems. We are so fortunate to have such expertise lead this work at the University of Waterloo. I now invite Dr. Lily Liu to speak on this topic. Thank you so much, Charmaine, Minister Blair, Honorable Bill Blair, Honorable Bardish Shacker, Members of Parliament Tim Lewis, Brian May, Valerie Bradford, welcome to the University of Waterloo. And thank you, Elder Mayingan Henry, and my colleagues from the Faculty of Health at the University uh, for attending today's formal announcement of such an exciting project. Uh, it's based on work that we have been doing over the past seven years, and uh, we are excited to be able to take the evidence that uh, we have garnered over the years of work with our HQPs, our um, graduate students and our team, colleagues uh, to actually get to the implementation and upscaling stage where we can actually evaluate the impact of the recommendations that uh, we make. Globally, there are 47.5 million people that are living with dementia and the pre prevalence in Canada is over 432,000. Two thirds of these uh, individuals are women. The risk of being diagnosed with dementia doubles every five year increase in age after 65. Annually, there are over 76,000 new cases of dementia diagnosed in Canada, representing 14.3 new cases per 1,000 adults 65 years and older, and this is rapidly increasing. Indigenous populations experience 34% higher rates of dementia compared to the general population. This is associated with higher risk factors such as lower education levels, lower socioeconomic status, higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, alcohol use, and poor health overall. So the subject of our project that's being announced today is really connected to the complex complexity of health in all of Canadians and in particular certain um, segments of our population. The risks of getting lost and going missing is a real concern for persons who are living with dementia. We discussed at the round table today that likely every person sitting around that table is affected or touched directly or indirectly by dementia at some point in their lives. It's estimated, and I say estimated because we actually do not know the real statistics, hence we are studying this, but it is currently now the best data we have is that it's estimated six out of 10 people with dementia will go missing at least once. And if not found within 24 hours, as Minister Blair alluded to, we think 50% will be seriously injured or diseased, but the real um, question is, what is the actual uh, statistic. Uh, most are found within um, the location that they went missing, but in our anecdotal conversations with first responders, they're telling us that that's not true. So this information is not published. We know anecdotally from care partners and even individuals who are living with dementia themselves that they can go missing. They can go much, much further than within the local vicinity. So they have a certain pattern of behavior of going, when they go missing that is different from other populations and that we must understand this in order to inform search and rescue personnel on strategies that will get them back home safely as quickly as possible. Um, I mentioned that these statistics are not reliable and there's no consistent approach to even define what going missing and getting lost is. So we're really starting from ground zero. Um, also, there is a myth that persons with dementia go missing only from their homes and so our immediate reaction typically is if they go missing or they're at risk, we try and put them away safely in a facility so they're locked up and they will be safer. But in fact, uh, recently a study done with a couple of two large police services anonymously found that uh, less than half actually, about 48% of missing incidents occur at home. 
In fact, 20% go missing from care facilities, 11% from hospitals, and 22% from the street or upper, other open spaces. And, as we've heard, Indigenous populations are under or not even represented in these situations and in these studies. So through this funding from the ministry, um, so for the data collection approaches initiative, which is one of the four initiatives, we um, have a data sharing agreement with Medical Alert Foundation of Canada, Edmund Police Service, and also Interi um, 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 organization to be able to study this. So through the funding from the Ministry of Emergency Preparedness, we're working to manage risks of going missing among persons living with dementia to build capacities for search and rescue personnel, but also with first responders and communities themselves because we know that we can't rely um, on the limited resources of just first responder personnel. This project aligns with Canada's national strategy on Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Uh, specifically to improve the quality of life of people living with dementia and their caregivers, as described in Bill C-233. This project also builds on the research, as I've mentioned, over the past seven years with the AgeWell National Center of Excellence uh, program. The university is working with partners to implement and evaluate the four initiatives, one of which is to analyze existing data that uh, are used in police, so search and rescue, vulnerable per person registry, medical alert, and to ride to understand missing person incidents and lost person's behavior specific to persons living with dementia. The other three refer to dementia-friendly education resources for first responders in seven provinces, including two indigenous communities, develop toolkits for communities so that they can build their own capacity and to explore and recommend um, a guideline based on best practice for return home interviews that is commonly used in Europe and with other populations as well. Our core partners represent, uh, are represented, and in some of which are represented in attendance today, and they include National Search and Rescue Secretariat, Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Calgary Missing Persons, um, Missing Older Adults Resource Network, the BC Search and Rescue Association, and BC Silver Alert. Dementia Advocacy Canada, Medical Alert, Interi, and SAR-1. Our Indigenous partners are Peguis First Nation in Manitoba and Kanawake, Ganawake Nation, Mohawk Territory, and Quebec. Um, I want to also just uh, recognize um, my, uh, my, my um, team members. Uh, this is just a small segment of, um, of them, and uh, they attended the um, roundtable discussions. Many of them uh, made great efforts to be able to travel here today, and in particular, uh, my co-PI, um, Dr. Antonio Miguel Cruz, who is um, a uh, adjunct uh, assistant professor here in the uh, Faculty of Health, but also is based out of the University of Alberta. Minister Blair, on behalf of my project team and our core members, I want to extend our gratitude to the ministry of uh, emergency preparedness for the uh, generous funds that will allow us to carry out this three-year project. We look forward to making a difference in mitigating risks of going missing in persons living with dementia. And uh, we truly appreciate the support um, and the validation you have provided to us this morning during the round table. And uh, we look forward to working with the ministry. Thank you for that overview, Dean Liu, and really like the co-creation model with the communities. That's so important. Minister Blair, I see we have some really excellent researchers, top-notch from the University of Waterloo, in attendance today and elsewhere running this project. So it's in great hands. Um, I'll now give the floor to Annie Cullinan from the Public Safety Canada team, who is going to act as moderator for the question period. Annie, the floor is yours. You referred to implementing, I didn't catch it, the 
over the three. Right. So we have been funded through the Age Well Network of uh, Centers of Excellence over the past seven years. And uh, many of us on the team are, in fact, Age Well uh, Network investigators. And through the seven years, and it includes actually care partners such as um, Ron Bellino and uh, Paul Lee, who are uh, individuals who are living with dementia. Age Well is very inclusive that way. And uh, through that network over the last seven years, we have been able to build a research program around this topic, but never really getting to recommendations of developing um, strategies for preventing, for mitigating, for collecting data. The seven years have just been, been spent on understanding what the issues are, doing literature reviews, um, collecting data with focus groups, and it is now that we are really ready to implement and to embark on uh, 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 co-creating strategies uh, that are adopted, customized by um, individual communities to meet their needs in truly a Canadian, in a Canadian context. Over the past seven years, we have also developed and established many international partners, and we have come to learn and understand uh, differences across uh, uh, the borders, across countries, in how even just the concept of um, going missing is, uh, is understood, how different jurisdictions uh, address it, uh, what silver alert actually means in different countries, it means different things in different countries, and how uh, much policy plays into this. So uh, we were instrumental in helping, for example, um, the Alberta government um, amend their missing persons um, legislation, but we have a PhD student who is working uh, on this particular uh, topic on policies, how many of these policies, for example, will bring up or, or um, brand Silver Alert as if they're doing something with it when in fact there's no program associated. And yet we've got provinces like British Columbia that has a Silver Alert program that's um, citizenship driven and yet there is no legislation tied to it. So we really are, and I think we're in the perfect faculty here at the University of Waterloo, we're so strong in policy and policy development to also have a, a, a branch looking at that. So um, that's just one of many examples over the last seven years that has led us to this stage where we can bring it all together. I hope that answers. Okay, you. you're welcome. Um, well, later on, you can also interview our um, two or three data experts here that are working on that uh, initiative, but we are really starting, uh, we are just learning now, for example, um, working with the police service, uh, we've just published, three of us here have just published a paper on the, the data silo um, uh, phenomenon that is occurring in this particular area. So, for example, because um, dementia is a health condition, and because of uh, privacy, health privacy legislation in Canada, um, services such as police services uh, keep the data siloed and don't share them. There's also um, differences in how they define missing um, and uh, or lost, uh, not just with dementia but with other populations as well. So uh, there's just uh, starting from we need to come up with a consistent uh, operational definition for what we mean by going missing, uh, what we mean by even age categories and, co and cognitive conditions, that sort of thing, because there's overlap between dementia and other populations, such as uh, adults with living with autism, as our other PhD student is studying. So um, we're, we're starting with uh, really, really very basic. We're understanding now that most uh, data, for example, collected is in free text. We've just completed analysis, our team just completed analysis of uh, medical alert data over the past several years, and uh, we're now embarking into and analyzing some of the data from uh, Edmonton Police Service and working with negotiations with relationships with other police services. And um, they are realizing, just in basic conversations with us, how disjointed the data is collected. Um, they, everyone is having difficulty even answering basic questions like how many people who are even in age category go missing. So um, we're, start, we're starting from really very basic questions there.
Certainly, just let me extricate my mask here. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, you said it was stated that Canadians have, have expressed concerns about how the RCMP share information about the public to the public in relationship to Nova Scotia shooting. Yes, sir. Um, did you tell the Commissioner Lackey to get Nova Scotia Mounties to release more information about the shooting because uh, you were not happy with the way the information was being released? No, sir, I did not. I, I, did, I gave no direction to Commissioner Lucky. I asked a number of questions, but as the Commissioner herself has confirmed a number of times, I gave no direction on any aspects of the police response, their investigation, or the information that they would communicate with the public. But we did hear very clearly concerns from the people of Nova Scotia, and it's one of the reasons why within the mandate of the Mass Casualty Commission, we asked the Mass Casualty Commission to examine very specifically the communications from the RCMP to the people of Nova Scotia during this event and, and, in, and following in its aftermath. But, but I gave no direction to the Commissioner. Yeah, of course. My, my job as the, then as the Minister of Public Safety was to, to in, ensure that information the on behalf of the Government of Canada was gathered with respect to the police response, but I know very clearly the, the line between uh, government responsibility for governance and oversight of the RCMP and giving direction in any way and at no time did I cross that line or any member of my government cross that line in giving direction to the Commissioner of the RCMP. Now, the Commissioner of the RCMP has also acknowledged that she had a difficult conversation with her own people, and I wasn't privy to that conversation, and I have no comment on it. But I can tell you with absolute certainty, I and, and my government did not give any operational direction or interfere in any way with the investigation or the police response. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, what conversations did you have with Lucky about uh, the guns used in the rampage and the upcoming legislation? All right. First of all, I, I did not. Um, I asked a number of questions with respect to the, to the event, and, and so I had a number of conversations and briefings from the RCMP and the police commissioner, um, the RCMP commissioner, about the event that transpired, but we did not talk about um, releasing of any of that information. I can tell you that the Government of Canada had been working for several months in, within my ministry on the development of um, a list of firearms that we pro eventually prohibited on May 1st by order in council, and the RCMP, of course, were involved in those discussions from the outset because they are responsible for administering the Canadian Firearms Program. But there was no nexus between that very important work and a promise we had made to Canadians and the investigation taking place, and at no time was there any direction given by me or any member of the government to the Commissioner of the RCMP as to what information should or should not be released for any reason. Um, just as a follow-up, this has really become a story of And, and again, I can only say exactly what I did, and I've said it several times, and, and, and that, that has been confirmed a number of times by statements issued by the Commission of the RCMP, in which she has confirmed that there was no interference and no pressure brought to bear with, with respect to the, in, the investigation or her communications on the investigation. And, and if there are any other questions with respect to this important event, I want to thank you all for your attendance and take the opportunity, if I may, to thank the University of Waterloo, their incredibly dedicated researchers and staff, and their community partners in this important work. We believe very much that, that good public policy should begin with science, research, and data. And, and we are very grateful for the partnership that the University of Waterloo provides to us in, in creating that data and that science to inform decisions that all of us will make going forward in order to keep Canadians safe. Thank you all very much.